Welcome to chapter 14, which focuses on the autonomic nervous system. If we look at where the autonomic nervous system sits in relation to kind of the rest of the parts of the nervous system, you'll see it sits as part of the peripheral nervous system, so it's not spinal cord or, or brain, it's out in the peripheral nervous system. It's not a sensory division, it's a motor division. Uh, there are two branches of the ANS, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division, and together they collectively work to maintain homeostasis for our body. Um, in terms of um, what they innervate, we're talking about glandular tissue, the smooth muscle of all your hollow organs like your GI tract, your, your genital tract, your respiratory tract, your blood vessels, um, and also the cardiac muscle of your heart. Um, so since their effectors are um, what we collectively generally refer to as viscera, organs, um, sometimes the autonomic nervous system is known as the visceral motor system. Um, the other name for the autonomic nervous system is the involuntary nervous system because all of the functions that are carried out here by the autonomic nervous system are not things that you have to consciously make decisions to do. Your body does it all for you subconsciously um, without you having to kind of really think about it. Um, so since the autonomic nervous system is the involuntary nervous system um, and the involuntary motor system and the somatic nervous system is our voluntary motor system, um, it can be helpful to kind of make some comparisons between the two. Um, so yes, since they are both motor, they are both going to have motor neurons, but they're going to differ in their effectors, kind of the general structure of their pathway, the neurotransmitters that they release, um, their target organs, what they innervate, um, and then the responses by those target organs to the release of the neurotransmitters. Um, so let's, let's make some comparisons here. Um, if we look at the effectors, you'll see that for the somatic nervous system, it's our skeletal muscle. Um, and the axon terminals are going to end with very discrete neuromuscular junctions. Um, remember, one axon terminal per one skeletal muscle fiber. Uh, the effectors for the autonomic nervous system are the smooth muscle, the cardiac muscle, and all of the glandular tissues, so both the endocrine glands and the exocrine glands like your sweat glands. Um, their endings are not those discrete neuromuscular junctions, but those diffuse neuromuscular junctions called the varicosities, where the neurotransmitters are spread out um, amongst many, many cells, um, and the cells all have gap junctions so they can communicate with one another. If we look at the pathway, the structure of the pathway, for the somatic nervous system, it's one really heavily myelinated axon um, that extends from the peripheral nervous system or from the central nervous system all throughout the peripheral nervous system to the effector organ, the, target, the, the skeletal muscle. The cell body for these somatic neurons are all in the central nervous system. So the neuron that innervates your toes for your ability to wiggle your toes has its cell body in um, the lower portion of the spinal cord and then the axon out in the peripheral nervous system. Um, in terms of the pathway for the autonomic nervous system, it's two neurons, not one. So we have a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron. So since we have a pre and a post, it also means we have a ganglia, a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. So the preganglionic neuron, it has its cell body in the central nervous system, it tends to be lightly, the axon tends to be lightly myelinated and it extends from the central nervous system to the ganglia, um, the cluster of cell bodies. The postganglionic neuron goes from the ganglia um, out to the effector organ and tends to be an unmyelinated axon. In terms of neurotransmitters, um, all of the um, axons for the somatic nervous system release acetylcholine. For the autonomic nervous system, all of the preganglionic neurons 
will re release acetylcholine into the ganglia, but the postganglionic neurons may release acetylcholine or um, a chemical called norepinephrine, another neurotransmitter. When acetylcholine gets released by the axons of the somatic nervous system, it is always excitatory. We always get ion channels opening for sodium, sodium influxing, and potentially if we get enough of those opening, threshold action potential sarcomere contraction. For the autonomic nervous system, it can be excitatory or inhibitory. So it may open ion channels for the influx of positive ions or the efflux of positive ions, or it may open ion channels for the influx of um, anions, negatively charged ions. And it depends on the receptor type. Um, so the autonomic nervous system can both stimulate things, um, speed them up as it were, and inhibit things, slow them down. Um, so let's look at that kind of in a visual form. You'll see here's our central nervous system. Here you see here's your somatic nervous system. The cell body is in the central nervous system. Very heavily myelinated motor neuron releases acetylcholine at the effector. The effector is skeletal muscle and the effect of acetylcholine on skeletal muscle is always excitatory. It's always stimulatory. If we look at the autonomic nervous system, if we look at them, um, we look at the parasympathetic first, actually. Um, if you look at the parasympathetic system, you'll see that it has um, a lightly myelinated axon um, with a C, well, actually all of them have their preganglionic neuron in the central nervous system. That's where their cell bodies are. And then here we see these ganglia these collections of cell bodies, and it happens to be the cell body of the postganglionic axon. Um, they are non-myelinated in the autonomic nervous system. Um, the preganglionic neuron is always going to release acetylcholine. The postganglionic neuron may release acetylcholine or norepinephrine um, to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, over the glandular tissue, and the effect of norepinephrine and acetylcholine may be stimulatory or inhibitory for these different organs, um, depending on the type of receptor that the neurotransmitter binds to. You'll also see um, this kind of special, what we call a misplaced ganglia of the sympathetic system. And this is the adrenal medulla. Um, and if you've ever heard of adrenaline or epinephrine, this is where that comes from. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So you definitely want to make um, a some comparisons and be able to make some comparisons in terms of what do the somatic nervous system have in common with the autonomic nervous system, how does it differ from the autonomic nervous system, and then also make some comparisons between the two divisions of the ANS itself. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, so yes, it is two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic, um, and it's considered dual innervation. So practically every visceral organ of your body gets innervation from both the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. Now there are some that are strictly sympathetic, um, and we'll talk about those, but just about all of them, um, that's why it's an almost all, um, are going to get innervation from both divisions of the ANS. They cause opposing effects. And so it's this idea of a dynamic antagonism um, that actually maintains our homeostasis and our ability to kind of maintain steady, relatively steady states um, despite changes in external environment. So the parasympathetic is known as the fight or flight branch of the autonomic nervous system. So in stressful t situations, the sympathetic nervous system takes over. The parasympathetic system is known as um, the rest and digest division. Um, and so it dominates when, um, after we've eaten, when we're just kind of chilling out as you guys, as you see here on this um, little balance beam. Um, and the balance beam is to demonstrate this idea of this dynamic antagonism, where if the sympathetic causes an increase in something, 
the parasympathetic is likely to cause a decrease in that exact same component, um, and so on and so forth. And it's kind of this back and forth balance beam of homeostasis um, between these two com kind of competing branches of the autonomic nervous system. So the parasympathetic, as I said, like I said, rest and digest, rest and relaxation. Um, so it tends to conserve body energy, um, kind of dominates all of your kind of maintenance. Um, so it's also sometimes known as the four Ds or the three Ds, excuse me, um, digestion, diuresis um, and defecation. And so um, you know, the parasympathetic tends to be really active after we've just eaten a meal um, because it's focused on um, digesting all of the food um, and extracting all the nutrients from our food and getting that to the body. Um, so it will constrict your pupils for close reading, right? So if you're kind of just chilling out, you don't really need um, really good peripheral vision. Um, so your pupils will constrict. Uh, it helps you see better close as opposed to further away. Um, it will also constrict the bronchioles in your lungs. The bronchioles are the passageways for air to get into your lungs. And again, if you're just kind of chilling out, relaxing, um, you don't need as much air, you don't need as much oxygen. Um, so the sympathetic system will constrict those passageways. Um, excuse me, the parasympathetic system will do that. Um, it also slows your, lowers your blood pressure, slows your heart rate, slows your respiratory rate. Again, it's the rest and relaxation division. Um, so it will inhibit those things, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, um, but it will stimulate digestion, the release of insulin from the pancreas, which helps us, um, which is very common after we eat. Um, it will stimulate urination and defecation um, and also plays a role in erections of um, our external genitalia. The sympathetic division is the fight or flight. Um, so it's all about stress situations, um, activity. So exercise, excitement, emergency, embarrassment, the four E's of the sympathetic division. Um, so if you think about what goes on when you're in a stressful situation, your pupils will dilate so you can have better peripheral vision. Your bronchioles in your lungs will dilate so more air gets into your body, which means more oxygen can get into your body, which means your body can work more efficiently. Um, the sympathetic division will inhibit digestion, urination and defecation, and insulin secretion. If you're in a stressful situation, your body is not going to spend as much energy digesting food because it's more focused on dealing with the stressful situation. Um, your heart rate will go up, your respiratory rate will go up, your blood pressure will go up, um, and actually salivation. Um, that's one of the um, kind of somewhat unique role of the sympathetic division. Um, and then the sympathetic division also dilates all your blood vessels. And we're going to talk about um, the sympathetic division and its specific role with blood vessels because it's really incredibly important. The parasympathetic division um, is also sometimes known as the craniosacral division, and that refers to kind of the origin of the different um, preganglionic neurons for the parasympathetic system. So for parasympathetic system, the neurons are going to originate at the brainstem and the sacral part of your spinal cord. They have very long preganglionic fibers. So the preganglionic uh, neuron will extend from the central nervous system almost all the way to the target organ. And so the peripheral nervous system ganglia are considered, considered terminal ganglia because they're closer to the end, the terminus of the whole route and so they're very close to or even potentially within the target organ. Um, since they have very long preganglionic fibers, they have very short postganglionic fibers that will go from the terminal ganglia to the effector. And don't worry, I have a picture of this too if that helps because definitely pictures are helpful I think when it comes to this kind of stuff. The sympathetic is the thoracocolumbar thoracolumbar division. I don't know why I had such a problem saying that word right now. Um, so the 
sympathetic neurons are going to originate in the thoracic region of your spinal cord and the lumbar region of your spinal cord. They have very short preganglionic fibers, um, and so their ganglia are considered paravertebral um, because they're nearer to the spinal cord, so para means. So since they have very short preganglionic fibers, they're going to have very long postganglionic fibers that will then synapse with their effector organs. So let's look at a nice little picture. So you'll see if we look at the parasympathetic, you'll see very long preganglionic fiber and terminal ganglia and then very short postganglionic fibers. If we look at the sympathetic system, you'll see they have relatively short uh, preganglionic fibers. So we have ver paravertebral ganglia and then longer postganglionic fibers. There's another um, kind of way we can compare both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Not only can we make comparisons in terms of their roles in the body, we can also make um, comparisons in terms of their structure. This table is from your book, it's table 14.5. Um, it goes through um, pretty much all of the organs, um, well, not all, but almost all of the organs of the body um, and tells you what their parasympathetic effect is and their sympathetic effect is. Um, it's helpful to look at, definitely. Um, you'll see that there are some areas um, where um, you'll see that the parasympathetic um, system doesn't innervate things like our sweat glands um, or the erector pili muscles. Um, You'll see if we look at glandular tissue, you know, parasympathetic stimulates the secretory activity of our glands. The sympathetic is going to inhibit secretory activity of our glands. And so that's that idea of this dynamic antagonism. Um, when it comes to the effects of the various divisions on all of these organs, the best thing to remember, because this looks kind of crazy, um, is what their overall role is. If you can think sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest, um, just think about what you would want your body to do in a stressful situation. And that's pretty much what the sympathetic division will cause. So I mentioned earlier the adrenal medulla. Um, if we go, I'm gonna go back here for a second, way back. That's this right here. You'll see it's part of the sympathetic nervous system, and it actually takes the place of the ganglion of this particular sympathetic route. Um, so the adrenal medulla um, secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine um, directly into the blood, um, and so they function these two neurotransmitters, very similar to hormones. Um, and um, epinephrine is what we refer to sometimes kind of out in the non-AMP world as adrenaline. Um, and so sometimes when the sympathetic nervous system kicks on, not only will um, all of the other postganglionic neurons release norepinephrine, but the adrenal medulla will secrete even more epinephrine and norepinephrine and really amp up um, the effects of the sympathetic system. This is why when we are swamped with adrenaline, when we are swamped with epinephrine, you hear stories about moms lifting cars off babies um, and so on and so forth. Those amazing feats um, that our body can do when we are stressed um, are in large part due to this secretion of norepinephrine and epinephrine from the adrenal medulla as part of the sympathetic nervous system. You have visceral reflexes, just like you guys have somatic reflexes. Um, you actually um, looked at one of your autonomic reflexes um, when you guys did the pupillary reflex test. Um, they have all the same components, so we still have a receptor, um, a sensory neuron, and integration center, an effector, um, but the visual reflex arcs have two neurons in the motor pathway, not just one, um, and they're all sensory neurons in terms of um, visceral, so they're gonna 
such things like chemical changes, stretch, irritation, not things like, you know, touch and things like that. That's a somatic function. Um, um, so urination, defecation, that referred pain um, that we talked about um, I, the other day, um, those are all reflexes um, that are kind of governed by the autonomic nervous system. Um, digestion is a reflex as well, um, and it's actually a three neuron arc, not a two neuron arc, and it involves something called the enteric nervous system, which is known as your gut brain. Um, you actually have more neurons in your gut than you do in your spinal cord, so that's the enteric nervous system. Um, so here you go, here's a kind of arc for a autonomic visceral reflex. So here's the receptor, sends it to the sensory neuron, um, gonna synapse right here in the integration center. Um, it could be a preganglionic neuron, which is what you see here. Um, it might be a inner neuron in the dorsal horn, um, or if we're talking about the enteric nervous system, um, within the GI tract. Um, and then the motor neuron takes the information from the integration center and has to synapse again in the ganglia, because um, here's our preganglionic in red, um, and then the postganglionic in, I don't know what you want to call that, brown? <laughs> um, so, uh, but it's kind of the same basic process um, as the somatic tests that you guys did in class. In terms of neurotransmitters, um, all of the um, parasympathetic um, postganglionic axons and all of the preganglionic axons of both the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions are what we call cholinergic fibers, cholinergic axons, because they release acetylcholine, hence cholinergic. Most of our sympathetic postganglionic axons, um, except for the ones with the sweat glands, are considered adrenergic fibers because they release norepinephrine, um, which the Brits call adrenaline, so adrenergic fibers. There are two types of receptors <coughs> for acetylcholine. Uh, nicotinic and muscarinic. Um, they are named after the drugs that bind to them, like nicotine. Um, so nicotine acts like acetylcholine um, when it binds to these different receptors in our target organs, um, and that's why nicotine affects us. Um, and, and muscarine is a, a gas um, that, again, acts like acetylcholine. Um, there are two classes of um, receptors for norepinephrine, um, collectively known as alpha receptors or beta receptors. The nicotinic receptors um, are found on all of our postganglionic neurons, both sympathetic and parasympathetic, um, and they're also found on the um, cells of the adrenal medulla um, and at the sarcolemma of our muscle cells. Um, so when we looked at the neuromuscular junction in chapter 9, that um, acetylcholine receptor on the muscle cell was a nicotinic receptor. Um, and the effect of acetylcholine at the nicotinic receptors is always excitatory, it's always stimulatory, it's always going to open ion channels and depolarize that postsynaptic um, cell um, neuron if it's a um, still within the nervous system, or maybe an effector if we're um, out in the peripheral nervous system. The muscarinic receptors are found on um, pretty much all of the postganglionic um, cholinergic fibers, or the, at least all, all the effector cells stimulated by those fibers. Um, and the acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptors um, it can be inhibitory or excitatory, um, kind of depending on the target organ. So for instance, acetylcholine, when it binds to a muscarinic receptor on cardiac muscle, slows the heart rate down, but when acetylcholine binds onto a muscarinic receptor on the smooth muscle in the small intestine, um, it'll increase the activity of the small intestine. Um, so the muscarinic receptors um, tend to have either excitatory or inhibitory effects, whereas the um, nicotinic are pretty much always excitatory.
Um, when it comes to the adrenergic receptors, the alpha and beta receptors, um, it really just depends on which subclass, whether it's beta-1 or beta-2 or alpha-1 or alpha-2, is kind of more prevalent on the target organ. Um, so um, when, for instance, norepinephrine binds to beta-1 receptors on cardiac muscle, it causes an increase. Um, when epinephrine binds onto beta-2 receptors, it causes a like relaxation effect, so like a slowing down kind of an effect. Um, so these adrenergic um, receptors um, and the adrenergic fibers um, can be kind of both excitatory or inhibitory. Um, there's a nice little table here from your book. Um, you'll see each of the receptor types, the major locations where we find them, um, and the effect of the neurotransmitter um, on when it binds onto the um, neuro the receptor on the target organ. Um, so I mentioned earlier kind of blood vessels and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, pretty much all of your blood vessels, our vascular system, is innervated almost exclusively by the sympathetic system. And so since your blood pressure in part depends on the diameter of your blood vessels, when we, were some, when we refer to sympathetic tone or vasomotor tone, um, we are talking about this kind of partial state of constriction that optimizes blood flow um, to keep our blood pressure at homeostatic levels. Um, so at homeostasis, the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine onto alpha receptors of the smooth muscle in the blood vessel walls and it releases or it sets sends action potentials um, at kind of a, a moderate rate like somewhere in the middle and so it keeps these blood vessels kind of partially constricted uh, which helps the blood flow through them um, the best and the, and the most easily that it can when the frequency of the action potentials increases from the sympathetic nervous system, then the blood vessels constrict or get smaller. This has the effect of raising our blood pressure. Conversely, when the action potentials from the sympathetic system slow down, the blood vessels will dilate and get larger, which lowers our blood pressure. And so our blood pressure is pretty much almost exclusively controlled by the sympathetic tone um, and the sympathetic nervous system. And it's kind of this balance when uh, between keeping the blood pressure at homeostat homeostatic levels. Parasympathetic tone is something that we refer to um, typically um, about the heart um, and then the GI uh, gastrointestinal and urinary tract organs um, and, and pretty much most of our glandular tissue um, in terms of endocrine glands and um, all the other glands in our body, uh, the pancreas, the liver, um, except the adrenal and the sweat glands. Those are sympathetic only. Um, so almost all of the time for most of us, the sympathetic division um, really kind of controls and dominates the functions of these organs in particular, the heart, GI, and urogenital tracts, and the endocrine system, and the other glands. <coughs> now conversely, when we are stressed out, um, the sympathetic division will basically just take over until the time of the stress has passed, um, and then parasympathetic will kick back in and kind of bring everything back to maintenance homeostatic levels. Um, so the medulla, the sweat glands, um, our erector pili muscles in our skin, the kidneys, and again, almost all of the vascular system only receive sympathetic innervation. Um, so when the erector pili muscles contract to make goosebumps, um, that's being caused by the sympathetic system. When you're sweating copiously, um, that's sympathetic nervous system. Um, 
So um, because the sympathetic system um, is the only one that innervates several of these, or, um, these organs here, it has some kind of unique functions that are just roles of the sympathetic system. One of them is our response to heat. Um, so when our body temperatures rise, all of the blood vessels in the skin will dilate that brings that nice warm blood. We have all these wonderful network of arteries and veins um, in our skin, very close to the surface. Um, and so when those blood vessels dilate, all that warm blood comes up to the surface of our body and the heat kind of radiates off of us. Um, your sweat glands will also be activated and you'll start to, to sweat more. The sweat will um, evaporate on your body and that's called evaporative cooling. It brings your body temperature back down. Um, conversely, when your bloody temperature drops, when it gets colder, your blood vessels um, in your skin will constrict and get smaller, which routes all that nice warm blood away from the surface of the body um, and more towards the internal viscera. And that helps us maintain our body temperature um, if it gets cold out. Renin is a hormone that comes out of the kidneys um, and activates this whole system that helps regulate blood pressure. Um, so again, that's only a sympathetic function because the kidneys um, are the ones that um, primarily receive uh, or are receiving primarily um, sympathetic innervation. Um, and then there are some kind of metabolic roles that are unique to the sympathetic system. Um, it tends to increase our metabolic rate. Um, again, if you're in a stressful situation, you want your body working faster, so your metabolism is going to go up. Um, it raises our blood glucose levels. Um, typically, it'll take fatty acids um, and proteins and turn them um, into fuel for our body, um, so more glucose and more fuel sources from fatty acids and proteins means we have more energy to deal with the stressful situation. Um, so those are just some kind of unique roles of the sympathetic division. Um, if we look at kind of, um, let's say maybe the length of the effect, um, the parasympathetic system, um, because it secretes acetylcholine at the effectors, um, its effects tend to be very, very short-lived and very, very localized because acetylcholine is pretty quickly um, degraded by acetylcholinesterase and so it's no longer effective. But the sympathetic division um, tends to have longer lasting, more systemic effects in part because norepinephrine doesn't get degraded as quickly as acetylcholine, um, but also because epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla act like hormones and are traveling through the blood directly. Um, and so that's part of that systemic nature, um, this kind of very prolonged effect of um, the sympathetic system. Um, in terms of kind of control of the autonomic ne nervous system, the hypothalamus is kind of the overall boss of the ANS. Um, we, we've mentioned that before, and that's where um, all of those nuclei in your um, diencephalon of your brain um, really regulate all of these subconscious activities that our body does for us. Um, the brain stem, all of the different uh, the red nuclei, the reticular formation, um, all of those brainstem nuclei, um, particularly in the medulla, take the instructions from the hypothalamus um, and then send that out to the spinal cord. Um, and then the spinal cord will also contain um, integration centers for um, many of our reflexes like urination and defecation and so on and so forth. But if you see here, if we look up at the hypothalamus here, you'll see that the hypothalamus also talks to the limbic system, and the limbic system talks to the cerebral cortex. Um, and then, of course, down, it, we can go the other way too, the cerebral cortex can talk to the limbic system, and the limbic system can talk to the hypothalamus. What this really means, this connection between the hypothalamus, the ANS, and the cerebral cortex, is that, yes, you can have conscious control over your bodily functions. Um, it, 
the example here is just the thought of food can make us salivate. Um, so if we take the thought of the food to make making us salivate, I'm gonna go back for a second. So we thought about food that connects and talks to the limbic system because let's face it, food is emotional for a lot of us. Um, the limbic system can talk to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus can then um, activate the ANS to have us start secreting saliva. Um, so that's a conscious um, connection between the cerebral cortex and what is generally an involuntary function. Um, what this also means is that you can have some control over your visceral functions. Um, you, if you, if, again, think about just getting stressed out in a test, right? If you sometimes get stressed, you can tell yourself, okay, I'm okay, I got it, I got it. Slow down, calm down, and you can make yourself calm down. Um, and this is a, um, a process called biofeedback. Um, if you become kind of hyper aware of kind of the physiology of your body, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, and consciously focus on them, um, you can you can influence them. Um, yogis do it, um, uh, people who meditate, that's a form of biofeedback. Um, I've seen it used to manage stress, migraines. Um, I've read some um, articles where um, snipers, um, because they have to remain in a position for a particularly long time, um, do lots of biofeedback training in order to slow their heart rate and their respiratory rate down and keep them um, at really low levels. Um, and so uh, you do have some kind of conscious control over your things, things like your heart rate, your blood pressure, um, and so on and so forth. But it does take training. So um, that's the end of the autonomic nervous system.